Radiation therapy is one of the most common treatments for cancer. In this video, we will walk you through the entire radiotherapy process from the planning phase to the final steps. Radiation therapy, or radiotherapy as it's commonly known, uses high energy x-rays known as radiation beams to destroy and damage cancer cells. Radiotherapy is commonly delivered in the form of photons, however we also use electron and protons to deliver radiotherapy. This energy has an ionising effect and therefore critically damages the DNA within cancer cells that leads to cell death and eventually tumour shrinkage. We also can use brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is a different type of radiotherapy. This uses radioactive sources which delivers radiation to the surrounding tissues or cavities. We use a radioactive source such as a radioactive piece of metal and insert that into a body cavity adjacent to or even directly into the tumour such as in prostate cancer. That slowly emits radiotherapy over a period of time and also causes cancer cell death. Mrs. Smith, please. Turn this way. The process begins with the patient attending an oncology outpatient appointment, where they will be advised on a management plan for the treatment of their cancer. As you know, your recent biopsy has demonstrated you have what's called a glioma, which is an aggressive brain tumour, and we need to offer you a course of chemo radiation with the hope of controlling it. The patient is talked through the treatment process in which the technique, dosage, timings and the possible side effects are discussed. Fatigue, possible headaches, nausea, you may find your concentration or your short-term memory is diminished slightly. There's a possibility you might lose some hair and have some skin irritation. I've got a consent form here I'd like you to have a look at and sign if you're happy to proceed with the treatment. Consent is obtained from the patient in order to proceed with the treatment. Sign your name at the bottom if you're happy to do so. Yes. Do you have any questions at this point? Uh, no. Okay. Radiotherapy can be administered with curative intent in that it's the primary treatment to try and cure the cancer or as an adjunct with the primary modality, if that may be surgery, or in the palliative setting where we know that the radiotherapy won't cure the cancer but nonetheless is a very effective treatment for helping with the symptoms of cancer. In this patient cohort, the side effects of radical treatment would not be acceptable and therefore we use shorter courses of treatment with fewer fractions. In a healthy patient, this type of treatment may increase the risk of late side effects. However, in this patient population with disease that we cannot cure, they are unlikely to ever suffer from that problem. Just into this room here. Come on in. Have a seat on the bed. Thank you. For the purpose of this video, we will demonstrate radiotherapy for the head and neck. So we just need your top layers of clothing off and we'll get you to lie down. Okay. The first step in the planning process involves immobilisation of the patient so that the radiotherapy treatment can be accurately targeted. This is done in the mould room where a support cast or mould is made. We're just going to raise the bed up. We're aiming high dose radiation into an area where things are quite close together. Um, the things that we're trying to treat, tumours, places where tumours have been, nodes where we think that tumours may be spreading to, um, are next to things that we don't want to treat, things like your spinal cord, your parotid gland, um, basically anywhere that is not tumour. So because everything's so close together and because your head is quite difficult to keep still without one of these devices, these devices uh, more important than in anywhere else in the body. You may see, see some green laser lights that are just running down the middle of your body and that's just so we can get you in the, in the middle of the bed and nice and straight for us. Oh. So all we're doing is just sucking the air out of that bag that you're lying on so it takes your shape. You have a bag that's filled with um, small polystyrene type spheres. You mould that to the shape of the patient's 
post area or the rear of the patient and then you remove all the air using a vacuum pump and when you've done that it becomes a rigid um, copy of the rear of the patient and that will stop them moving again and make sure that they relocate into the same position every day. So what we're going to do, we're going to pop the mask in the warm water and then when it's ready we're going to pop it on you. So it will be quite warm and quite wet when it goes on. Mm -hmm. We'll get you to close your eyes so you don't get any water in your eyes and then there'll just be a little bit of molding as we'll melt in the mask to you. So if you just want to close your eyes, we're just going to take the mask out of the water. So here we go, a little bit warm and a little bit wet. And we'll just be moulding the mask to you. The accuracy you're looking for is to look to two to three millimetres. And sometimes for the for the what we call the stereotactic radio surgery, sometimes you're looking for a one millimeter accuracy. So it's the patient shouldn't be able to move, and we we explain this to the patients and coach them. And when you explain the the idea around it, they they're willing to to um, comply. Just a couple of minutes before it's completely set, then we can take it off. So it takes a little wriggle. So there's the mask. In the majority of the cases, we do use thermoplastic. The materials they use nowadays are very robust. Um, they're impregnated with Kevlar, which make them very um, hard and very very difficult to misalign and, and um, deform. Um, but in some cases, we do use a clear plastic shell. Um, and that would be in, in the consultant's preference Sometimes if there's an area that you need a lot more detail, for example, around the hand, because we do the other parts of the body outside from the head and neck, or around the inner canthi of your eyes, around the nose, areas where you need greater detail, and the plastic shell can be more beneficial because the way that we manufacture it allows for us to get a better contour of the patient's skin. Sometimes we make lead blocks, personalised lead blocks, that will shape the radiation, um, the shape of the radiation in a certain way. What's more common is that we use things that will trick the radiation into, into modifying where the dose ends up being delivered in the patients. So things like wax blocks, things like um, lead eye shields, things like, um, like a, a wax. Some, in some patients we use a total wax, um, almost like a wax skull cap. And, and that would be used for brachytherapy, where they put catheters into the wax and they fire radioactive sources into those catheters. And that's for, use, that's for treating scalps, where you want the dose to the scalp to be high, but you want the dose to the skull and any brain beneath it to be very low. So when you're ready, you bring your legs there. So the next part of the process would be that the patient would have a CT scan in exactly the same way that the patient was immobilised in the mould room. So we'd use the same immobilisation equipment. So for a head and neck patient, that would be a cast or mould that's made of their head. We would lay the patient down on the treatment couch in the same position with that mould on. And the mould's got two purposes. One is to keep the patient nice and still so that the treatment can be very accurate. And the second is so that we can pop some skin marks onto the patient's cast rather than directly onto the patient. And that makes the treatment very accurate because we can identify where it is that we need to treat. These are the marks on the patient's cast and the green laser lights need to intersect. So what we'll use then is this position on the top. Tips fine, yeah. And these are the markers and they have a metal ball bearing on which just go against the area that we're going to scan and they show up on the scan. I'm going to drive the patient into the correct position. We can see the structures that we need to treat. So for the cancer patients coming for their radiotherapy, the doctor can see where their actual cancer is. They can draw around where the cancer is and give that an appropriate margin so that we know where to treat. But it also enables us to see the structures that don't need any treatment, so those critical structures within that area. For other areas of the body that we scan, we would put tattoo marks on the patient's skin. Once the tattoo marks are in those positions, we can then place the patient in exactly the same position each time for treatment, and it means that the treatment can be delivered in exactly the same position each time. There are reference marks, they're what everything is given in relation to. 
Once we've marked the area with the skin pen and we need to tattoo the area, we would use a tattooing kit. And in that, we would have a wipe, some tattooing ink and a small needle. We would wipe the area clean first, and then we would open the needle. And we would dip just the end part of the um, sheath into the pot, place the ink on the patient's skin, and just using a very fine needle, we would just place the tip of that needle into the centre of the area that we've placed the ink. The reason why we use a very small needle is because we want the area to be big enough for the radiographers to see, but not a permanent reminder for the patients. So Joan, if you look at the contrast to enhanced MR scan yeah. this person's had, and using that, draw a gross tumour volume. The next stage of the therapy is the outlining phase. The clinical oncologist reviews the scans and outlines the areas where the tumour is located. Yeah, I've also outlined the organs at risk here. So these are areas that we want to try and avoid getting any radi dose of radiation or minimise the dose of radiation that they will get and make sure that they're in receiving a radiation dose that they can tolerate and recover from. Once prepared, these are handed over to the planning department. Here, the planning radiographers and physicists carefully work out a treatment plan based on the outlining completed by the clinical oncologist. This is an important part of the planning process because it means we are able to protect certain organs that are surrounding the tumour site. In this case, particularly the spinal cord, and the parotids. Um, it also enables us with an ARC treatment, BMAP treatment, to be able to give conformal dose to the tumour site, which means we can increase the dose that, that we have, are able to provide the patient with. So we outline all the organs at risk, and then we place our beams on the plan. During the planning process, we quite often need the consultant's input it's quite often a process where you have to play one organ off against another organ and it's the consultant's decision during this process as to which he requires the lower dose to be two. Um, so often we will call the consultants down to have a look on screen at what we've done, quite often with the choice of two different plans and they can then select which one they think is optimal for the patient. That's all right. That's fine. If you could print it out. It. Okay. Once completed, the plan is approved by the clinical oncologist. The completed plans are then sent to the treatment machine. Okay. This treatment machine is the linear accelerator. The machine uses external beam therapy at certain angles which are tailored individually for patients. We can move the couch in the vertical, longitudinal, lateral, and we can also do rotation. These are fairly complex machines in which high energy electrons are fired into a tungsten target that then generates X-rays that can be directed at a patient and subsequently a tumour. Treatment can um, be delivered through a full 360 degrees because the couches are made from carbon fibre so they're actually put into the treatment plan so the plan actually is calculated to go through the couch and it just gives a better dose to the patient because we can deliver um, the treatment through less normal tissue. The killer voltage arms are um, mounted at 90 degrees to the treatment head so they take in either killer voltage just planar x-rays, two-dimensional, or we can do a three-dimensional cone beam um, scan. So that gives us a 3D image of the patient. The multi-leaf collimator is um, like small leaves that shape the treatment. So it can shape where we're treating. It can also stop any normal um, tissues that are by where we're treating from being irradiated. So it just makes the patient's treatment very conformal to them. Once the patient goes in the treatment room, the patient's cast is put on. The radiographers set up the treatment machine using the treatment plan that has been decided. 
Lasers are used with the tattoo marks to align the patient in the correct position. We were checking the distance, so it's the FSD, so it's the distance from the source to the patient. So we check that each day to make sure it's another check that the patient's in the right position. When the radiographers have finished setting up, they leave the room to perform final checks. Because x-rays travel in straight lines, we use a maze instead. So it's, um, the maze has a series of turns, so the x-rays can't travel out of there. We have a door interlock, so the last person out of the room presses the door interlock to say that the only person in the room is the patient, and then again presses another interlock outside of the room. And we can also have emergency stop, so if the patient does move, um, we can stop the treatment from outside the room or inside the room. Final checks are then made before the machine is switched on and the treatment is delivered. Okay, Mrs Smith, you're doing really well there. We're just going to start the treatment now. The patient at this point is expected to remain still. The procedure process is monitored very carefully and usually lasts 10 to 15 minutes. Radiotherapy is typically delivered in daily treatments called fractions. An important point to note if someone is undergoing radical or curative radiotherapy is that there should not be any treatment delay i.e. time between fractions, and you should try and adhere to the prescribed duration of radiotherapy. A treatment gap will allow the cancer to regrow and potentially will compromise the outcome of their treatment. Following completion of radiotherapy, Patients continue to be seen regularly in clinics to assess and manage the response as well as the side effects of the treatment. A little bit of fatigue um, and some nausea, but I am feeling much better. Normal tissues within the body exhibit a, a threshold tolerance to radiotherapy. Above this, this threshold, the normal tissues become damaged and contribute then to acute side effects such as skin redness, or blistering or sore mouth due to mouth ulcers. Early side effects refer to those experienced during the radiation period or in the weeks thereafter and are typically related to the inflammatory effect of radiotherapy. These normally settle down with supportive care and spontaneously. Late effects are typically mediated by fibrosis and scarring. And these can be experienced months to years after someone has undergone radiotherapy. Here is a recap of the process. Consent is obtained from the patient to proceed with the treatment. A mould is made for the patient if required, followed by a CT scan to identify the exact location of the tumour. Planning radiographers and physicists work out a treatment plan based on the outlining and approval of the clinical oncologists. The patient is treated on the treatment machine using the plan that has been decided. Patients continue to be seen regularly in clinics after treatment to assess their response to the treatment and management of their side effects.